Hello and welcome to iNerdius and the 59th episode in my series on the 100 novels that I think best represent 20th century science fiction. And in this episode, I am talking about A Billion Days of Earth by Doris Pisertia. It was published in 1976 as a Frederick Pohl selection, as you can see there on the um, on the cover. So it was in the same line of books that Fred Pohl chose uh, along with Dahlgren and The Female Man. So, in great company. It's a great example of far future science fiction and also of just how inventive uh, science fiction writers can be when it comes to the creation of their, uh, their setting and their characters. So, it is set, as the title says, a billion days in the future or approximately three million plus years. And the humans in this book are actually basically on the level of gods. So superficially, kind of like Lord of Light by Zelazny, um, but of course set on Earth and not on another world. And the main characters are actually not the humans who have evolved into gods, but they are uh, a rat who has uh, evolved into a human. So rats have evolved into humans. Uh, and also a dog that has evolved. And so dogs have evolved into humans. And then there are other characters that have been genetically engineered to be a cross between, um, I think, a, a wasp or a bee and a cat. <laughs> um, and then lastly, there is another character called Sheen, who is a one-off. He is not part of any race. He is apparently either of alien origin or somehow was created um, deep in the bowels of the earth. And basically his purpose is to absorb the egos of, uh, of the rest of the world, basically. And so very interesting in that regard. I, I see this as um, an example of Freudian science fiction. So to a certain extent, Gateway by Frederick Pohl made a lot of use of Freudian psychology, and this book does too, although again, more superficially than um, than I think Gateway does. But it's just a very whimsical novel. It's um, The dialogue is very whimsical. The characters are um, almost universally sarcastic in some way. There are a couple of characters who aren't so much sarcastic, but um, there's a lot of that, a lot of uh, repartee going back and forth between characters when they talk to each other. Uh, the rat humans, if you will, um, while they have evolved, they may have been helped along by the gods, the the humans who have been um, who have evolved into gods. They may have or may not have helped the rats evolved and the dogs evolve. And I think they definitely though were responsible for the creatures that are part honeybee and part cat. Um, the humans otherwise do not bother to get involved in the affairs of the, the rat humans or the dog humans or their wars or their politics or anything like that, unless they have no real choice, uh, unless they get drawn into it, which kind of does happen. Um, one interesting uh, aspect of the rat human culture is that they they actually have um, a manufacturing facility that makes mechanical hands for them because they do not actually have hands with fingers. They still have you know rat paws basically, and um, somehow they're able to create these mechanical hands that allow them to manipulate things the way humans manipulate things. Another interesting aspect of this book that I found really inventive and kind of fun was that rat culture, the human rat man culture, whatever you want to call it, um, really, and their history really uh, has um, a parallel with, with our history. And this is because the human gods have essentially decided that whenever they see some sort of a close enough uh, parallel or um, association with something happening in their culture, they basically provide 
the the names from our history. And so the rat human culture, the rat person culture, they have their own version of Socrates and Plato and Jesus and all of those things. And also, you know, Freud um, and that kind of stuff. And so it's brought up, it's actually brought up in the book and the, the rat people kind of are aware of this. Um, there is definitely some awareness that they are not uh, they did not evolve necessarily completely on their own and also evolved from a type of animal that humans mostly found repulsive, whereas the the dog people learned that they uh, evolved from an animal that was entirely subservient to humans. And so both both dog people and rat people who learn about this are sometimes somewhat disturbed by it. So that was kind of a neat uh, approach to um, how these characters understand and talk about their culture and their history. Um, other than that, I would say it's it's not really plot heavy. There is um, this idea that this character Sheen is absorbing all of the egos of these people and essentially leading to the collapse of civilization. And he sets his sights on the gods, but the gods, their egos are too strong for Sheen to take over. But the gods kind of understand that it's only a matter of time and so they decide to leave the earth to go to another planet, um, leaving the rat people and the dog people to the devices of Sheen. And that's kind of that's kind of where the story ends. Um, a couple of other interesting things that get thrown in. Uh, occasionally, I think because the, the rat people are genetically engineered, so their evolution is not natural, so to speak. When they have, uh, when somebody is born, especially if it's due to uh, some inbreeding, so like in the upper classes, especially, but not necessarily, the um, the offspring can be more of an animal than a civilized or or reasoning human being, rat human being, if you will. And one of the characters does encounter. I think it's the main character does encounter his progeny who is essentially animalistic, who can't be reasoned with, and is essentially uh, the equivalent of a mad dog serial killer type of a character. So, um, And they keep them in zoos. That's the other thing. So a zoo, in this particular instance, has animals in it, but some of those animals are actually rat people who were born without the reasoning capability that the human gods imparted to them. So pretty interesting. I wouldn't say it's my favorite book. It's a fairly easy read. Like I said, the writing style is very lighthearted. It's very whimsical. There are a lot of characters to keep track of, and not all of them have anything or much to do with the central plot, if you will. Although, like I said, it's not really a plot-heavy book. It's just events are unfolding, and the characters are reacting and trying to decide what to do, if anything, about it. So, um in that regard, it might not be for everybody, but I felt like um, it it's a good example of a, a whimsical science fiction novel, um, Freudian psychology used in science fiction, far future science fiction, but also just a great example of how inventive and weird um, a, a writer can make his or her or their story and, and not have it have to be literary. So, you know, you might make a comparison to Gene Wolfe, whereas in Gene Wolfe's books, they're very literary. The writing is sometimes um, uh, opaque, I guess, and um, difficult to understand. In this particular book, you still have, I think, that same level of inventiveness, but with a much easier to read, almost journalistic style, whimsical journalistic style, like I said, of writing. So, um, for those reasons, I have decided to include it on my imaginary bookshelf of the 100 novels that I think best represent 20th century science fiction, A Billion Days of Earth by Doris Pasertia. Thank you very much.